Today, Brett Campbell, Stakeholder Engagement Coordinator with Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, or ABMI, will be talking about mammal monitoring in Alberta. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Don't miss our upcoming Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars. On September 17th, Heather Harris from Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks will be presenting a webinar about swift fox recovery. That's September 17th at noon. Check out the PCAP web website to register for this webinar or other upcoming webinars. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Crescent Point Energy, Sask Energy, Sask Power, and Wildlife Habitat Canada, our supporting sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by ABMI. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation, and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about today's presenter. Brett Campbell has been the Stakeholder Engagement Coordinator for the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute since May of 2017. She is both a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and a Master's of Science in Natural Resource Economics from the University of Alberta. In her role with the ABMI, Brett has been sharing the story and science of Alberta's biodiversity with stakeholders and partners throughout the province. When she's not at work, you'll either find her enjoying the great outdoors or with her pottery wheel. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brett. Hello, everyone. Sorry, just trying to figure out the technology here. Okay, can you see my screen? <laughs> yes, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Brett Campbell and I'm the Stakeholder Engagement Coordinator at the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, but from now on I'll just call it the ABMI for short. I'd like to say first thank you to all of you for having me here today, and a special thank you to Caitlin for putting in the hard work to organize this webinar. So now without further ado, I'll dive into my presentation. but only if my scroll buttons work. There we go. <laughs> so as I mentioned, I'm here today to talk about the monitoring activities of the ABMI. In today's presentation, I'm gonna skip over our land cover habitat and human footprint monitoring activities, and instead go straight into discussing our species monitoring. Then I'm gonna move into a discussion of the data that we collect with a focus on mammals, a bit about what we do with the data, how we're changing the way that we are monitoring mammals moving forward, and how we are making our data freely and publicly available. So let's get started with some background information on the organization. The ABMI's mission is to track changes in Alberta's wildlife and their habitats from border to border and to provide ongoing, relevant, scientifically credible information on Alberta's living resources for Alberta's land use decision makers and for Albertans. Our organization is divided into six centers, which each perform various key functions for the organization, delivered by our different partners. So for example, the monitoring activities of the organization are delivered through InnoTech Alberta and our monitoring center, which is based in Beggarville. The processing of specimens is done at the Royal Alberta Museum here in Edmonton. And our other centers are housed at the University of Alberta, performing other functions such as scientific analysis, knowledge translation, and applied research. So as I mentioned, through these six centers, we deliver on a variety of key functions. But today I'm here to talk about our extensive species monitoring across the province. If you are interested in learning more about our land surface monitoring activities, such as human footprint reporting or the Alpha program, we have actually recorded a few of our own webinars which discuss these things um, and they're posted on our YouTube channel, channel that are available for anyone to watch. So just let me know at the end and I can give you a link. 
So our primary species monitoring program is our ecosystem health monitoring program. The core components of this program include a systematic grid of 1,656 sites, which are spaced evenly every 20 kilometers across the province. At each of these sites, we collect information on seven taxonomic groups, birds, mammals, plants, moss, lichens, soil invertebrates, and aquatic insects. We do repeated sampling at each of these sites, returning approximately every seven years in order to track change and calculate trend. And now I'll jump more specifically into our mammal monitoring activities. So historically, ABMI has used snow tracking methods to monitor mammals. Field technicians would head out into the field approximately three days after the last snowfall event and move along a 10 kilometer transect. As the technicians moved along the transects, the number of tracks of each species intersecting the transect would be recorded. Because data were collected at varying times since the last snowfall event, days since last snow snowfall would also be recorded. At the time that we developed this, this protocol, Snow tracking had several advantage, advantages over other methods. So first, um, it detected more species than other methods, such as hair snares or aerial surveys. Secondly, it was passive, relying on natural animal movements to leave countable tracks. And third, it did not influence the behavior of animals as the visits to count tracks occurred after the animal left the area. We collect the snow tracking data for almost a decade, and with it, there are a variety of analyses that ABMI conducts to understand the wide variety of species that make their homes in Alberta, what habitats they're found in, and how our land use activities impact those, their populations. So first, I'll talk about habitat associations. So we develop habitat associations for a number of species in the province. This example shows the habitat associations for deer, both mule and whitetail, in the prairie region of the province. The graph shows species relative abundance with the bars in each soil type and human footprint type in the prairie region. The vertical lines indicate 90% con confidence intervals. The presence or absence of trees greatly affects the presence and abundance of many species. Therefore, separate figures are presented for treed and non-treed sites in the prairie region. Right now, I'm just showing the graph for non-treed sites. As we can see here, deer relative abundance is similar among soil types in the prairie region, with rapid, rapidly drained and productive soils showing the highest predicted abundances. We can also use the data we collect on species and their habitats, particularly human footprint information, to determine the impact of different types of human footprint or different sectors on the species relative abundance in the region. The impact of that activity on a species is determined by three factors. First, how much area the footprint occupies. Secondly, how strongly, either positively or negatively, the species responds to the, to the footprint. And third, how much of the footprint is in higher versus lower quality habitat for the species. So the y-axis of this graph <clears throat> shows the percent population change per unit area of the sector's footprint. <clears throat> the x-axis shows the total area occupied by each sector's footprint in the region. The areas of the sector specific rectangle which is equal to the unit effect multiplied by the area of footprint, is the total effect of the sector on, a, on the species relative abundance in the region. As you can see, the unit effect of all human footprint types on deer, uh, deer predicted relative abundance are small in the prairie region. We can also use our data to determine how predicted relative abundance of, of a species is different now compared to a reference condition. So this map 
shows predicted relative abundance according to what we call a reference condition. EBMI defines this reference condition as what the landscape would look like if all the human footprint had been backfilled based on the native vegetation in the surrounding area. The current condition on the right is the predicted relative abundance of the deer taking current human footprint into account. We can use the estimated changes in relative abundance between the reference condition and current conditions and information about human land use to calculate something that we call our biodiversity intactness index. To report on the status of biodiversity in Alberta, the EBMI developed the Biodiversity Intactness Index. The index reflects how modifications to habitat as a result of human activities results in changes to species abundance. To demonstrate this change, we have both an increaser species and a decreaser species for the grasslands region on this index. The Baird Sparrow is the decreaser species and the coyote represents the increaser species. The intactness ranges from 0% to 100%. At 100% intact, the abundance of both species is equal to the abundance expected in an undisturbed area. So basically how many of those species we would expect with no human activity. As the inta intactness index declines toward 0%, it reflects a change in the abundance of a species in response to human footprint. For the Baird Sparrow, a decrease in number is observed. For the Coyote, an increase in number is observed. This is a map of intactness of all mammal species combined in the grasslands natural region of Alberta. The list of species that we have included in this analysis include hares and rabbits, Canada lynx, coyote, deer, elk, foxes, gray wolf, marten and fisher, mink, moose, red, square, red squirrel, and weasels and ermine. The areas in green show the areas where intactness is 100%. Areas becoming progressively more purple demonstrate areas with decreasing intactness of overall species. According to this graphic, it looks like quite a large portion of the region is around 65 to 85% intact. This analysis can also be done for any individual species or region or subregion in the province. For example, here is the same analysis completed for only the mixed grass natural subregion of the province. This can be replicated across any region, as I said, and also across species and species groups. For the purposes of today's presentation, however, I'm only showing mammal intactness, which encompasses all those species I mentioned earlier. However, if you're interested in seeing the results for different species, they are available on our biodiversity browser. Um, I'm going to share a link with you for that in just a moment. So although we use snow tracking methods for about eight years to collect an impressive amount of data on mammals, the method comes with its limitations. Some of which include requiring suitable snow conditions, the exclusion of hibernating mammals of interest, so for example, bears, difficulty distinguishing between species with similar tracks, such as Martin and Fisher, and finally a high, higher potential for observer error. So as time went on and remote camera technology continued to develop, 
ABMI began looking into the, the potential benefits of using remote cameras as an alternative to snow tracking for mammal monitoring. We evaluated the feasibility of using camera trap surveys to monitor mam mammals in a report that we released in early 2014. And these days, the EBMI monitors mid to large sized mammals using 800 to 1,000 remote cameras deployed annually across the province of Alberta. Each year, we collect millions of image images from these cameras. Using remote camera technology has proven to be a game changer. The cameras, initially a relatively cheap investment of anywhere between $200 to $700, depending on the camera you go with, once installed can be left out for a year. While out, the cameras, which are triggered by heat and movement and collect information on everything from rabbits to bears, are collecting that information both day and night. As an added bonus, anyone can put these things out. So it doesn't require any kind of scientific expertise to do it. And in fact, we've developed a series of easy to follow and publicly available protocols for deploying cameras that anyone can use. So when I said millions of photos, I meant it. <laughs> Between 2015 and 2018, we collected about 9 million images across the province. In the Prairie region alone, we deployed just over 500 cameras over that same time frame and collected about three and a half million images. Suddenly, we were faced <laughs> with a dilemma, which was, okay, so it's cheap and easy to put these things out and we're getting tons of data, but the question became, how do we possibly deal with it all? <laughs> And did I mention that lots of those photos were of cows or triggered by vegetation? Could we really afford the amount of time it would take to go through and filter all those photos out? So uh, we decided to develop a platform to support the immense work of data processing and analyses that we suddenly needed to do. And this platform uh, is now called WildTracks. So what is WildTracks? Well, in a nutshell, it is a web-based platform that we developed, as I mentioned, partly to support the storage, processing, and analysis of our remote camera images. It doesn't just work for cameras, however. We also use it for management of the terabytes of data that we've also collected from the autonomous recording units, or ARUs for short, that we use for monitoring vocalizing species, such as birds and frogs. In the future, we envision wild tracks supporting numerous other environmental sensors as well. We wanted this platform to easily enable data sharing, collaboration, and transparency between the variety of data collection projects across the province, country, and even internationally. Some key functions include the storing and processing and exporting of data. It also allows you to assign project managers who can then assign specific tasks and projects to their staff. The platform even has features to auto filter out photos of cows and photos triggered by blowing vegetation. So this is something that the folks in your region of the world might be quite excited about. <laughs> We're also currently developing a citizen science portion of the platform, which will support crowd-based data tagging and allow any individual with a camera to upload their data. So why would anyone want to use wild tracks? Well, there are a variety of reasons. One particularly compelling reason is the time savings. So this platform has been shown to save up to 90% of the time previously required to take photos because of a variety of functions that we have incorporated, including the auto cow function, with, which automatically takes photos of cows. But there are a number of other reasons, including opportunities for engagement, for example, with the citizen science component of the platform, the cost savings, and the ease of use of the platform. 
So the part of the platform that we developed to support AR use is fully operational right now and is even being used on a national scale by Environment and Climate Change Canada. The camera platform is being launched in just a couple weeks here. And we've already completed several months of beta testing, both internally and by some of our external partners. And finally, the citizen science portion of the platform we're currently expecting to have completed by December of this year. So we're really excited for the whole platform to come completely operational. So we have all this data, but as of yet, we haven't been able to release our models using the camera data. But we have been able to pick up some really interesting tidbits of information about a variety of species. So, for example, we've been able to collect a reasonable number of detections of relatively uncommon species, such as pronghorn and badgers. So the detections are marked on the map by the larger red dots. The small red dots represent sites that we've visited and not had detection of those species. We've also determined that elk appear to have scattered populations across the province, including in the grasslands, parkland, mountains, and southern boreal. And very interesting, we've actually captured a number of detections of rare species, including 21 detections of swift fox and 14 detections of wild boar. We are now also able to detect patterns in certain species including which avoid or are often detected near human development. For example, many species in the northern forested area tend to avoid urban centers, such as the wolf. However, other species in the south, such as skunks and coyotes, are relatively common and are also commonly associated with human developed areas. So what's going to change once we do begin incorporating all this camera data into our analyses? Well, hopefully it just means better and more ac accurate models of more species. So for example, we'll now be able to model bears because of camera data, whereas snow tracking didn't capture them due to the fact that they hibernate in the winter, so they weren't leaving tracks anywhere. In addition, looking forward, we hope to eventually use the Im images to analyze other information such as demographics, body conditions, and health of species. So we expect our camera data models to be released sometime in the spring or early summer of 2020. The results are currently being reviewed by external scientists. So before I digress too much into the world of camera traps and all the fascinating information we can glean from them, um, I think I'll, I'll stop there just in the interest of time. But if, if you do have any questions about wild tracks or would like more information about it, please do not hesitate to contact either Karina Kopp or Alex McPhail. Um, they're the wild tracks project coordinators and I've listed their email addresses here. Um, I'm expecting Karina to show up in my office any moment here to help me take questions too. So hopefully she'll be here to field any questions you have for her. Otherwise, um, we are also planning a Wild Tracks webinar for October 15th. So if you are signed up for our newsletter at abmi.ca or you follow any of our social media accounts, we'll be announcing the opening of registration approximately a month before then. So um, we look forward to having you guys there. Um, just Thank before, you so much. Oh, sorry, sorry I have two more slides. <laughs> um, the, uh, just before complete, concluding the presentation, I just wanted to let you guys know that all of ABMI's data is publicly available for free on our data and analytics portal at abmi.ca slash data. Um, in addition, all of the information from the models and analyses for a variety of species that I briefly shared with you earlier are available on our biodiversity browser. So if you just go to abmi.ca slash data and click on the biodiversity browser button, it'll be brought to this screen. 
um, and you can do a search on any species that you like. Um, you'll find profiles for hundreds of Albertan species there and we're constantly adding more as the data becomes more and more available and our models become more robust. Um, I'll mention just quickly once again that currently the profiles, the species profiles with the different models and information currently um, are using the data that we collected from snow tracks. Um, but as I said, in the spring or early summer of 2020, um, we, are, we will have the models released with the, using the camera trap data just after their external review is complete. Um, so just in a quick summary of everything that I talked about, um, basically the ABMI, we monitor wildlife and habitats across the province. Today we just talked about, about mammals, but I probably could talk to you guys for hours about everything that we do. Um, all the data that we collect is used in part to model a variety of complex species habitat relationships. Um, the ABMI is now using remote camera data instead of snow tracks data to monitor mammals. And we've developed a really cool new platform called Wild Tracks to support the storage processing and analysis of that data. And finally, um, we really pride ourselves in making all of our data publicly and freely available to anyone at abmi.ca slash data. And that, like, that finally, I was kind of tricking you guys, I think I was done earlier, but that finally brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I'll be happy to try and take some questions. It doesn't, looks like Karina got held up somewhere else, so I'll do my best. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to field them now. Um, and I, I will say that I, I told Caitlin earlier, I'm a bit of an ABMI generalist. So if there's anything really specific about our modeling, et cetera, I'll probably point you in the direct, direction of Marcus Becker here, just listed at the bottom of the slide. He is our mammal specialist in the Science Center. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brett, for the awesome presentation. I had no idea that ABMI did so much work. It's, it's pretty amazing. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, there are a few questions here from our audience, and to anyone else who has any questions, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Uh, the first question is from a listener named Reed, and he would like to know, does wild tracks have any overlap with nature links? Um, <laughs> Reed, you're an ABMI fan, I see. Um, at the moment, no. The thing that they'll have in common is that they'll both be supporting citizen science efforts. Um, this, the difference with wild tracks is that we're asking for specific, so I guess I should say that ABMI has a, a citizen science app called Nature Links in which we encourage people to go and take photos of nature, upload to the app. Um, we have scientists that go through and validate their sightings. Um, and so he's asking about that. Um, the difference between nature links and wild tracks is that wild tracks upload specifically camera trap photos. So once we have the citizen science component available for wild tracks, um, people will be invited to upload their, their camera trap data, but uh, slightly different from nature links. I hope that answers the question. I think so, thank you. Um, there is a question from a listener named Paul. Is it possible to rent or borrow the cameras that ABMI has for wildlife monitoring for a set period? Um, that's a good question. Karina has just walked into the door, our wild tracks guru. So I, I know that we're currently reviewing all of our protocols and stuff like that for the use of equipment. So I'll just let her give her best answer for now. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us um, and my apologies for being a little late to the question session. Um, in terms of uh, renting equipment, so this is something that we're still assessing at this point. Um, we have done it on a, a bit of a case-by-case -case basis um, currently, but moving forward um, I think it is something that we might um, consider um, in terms of having those units just because they can be uh, somewhat um, expensive for uh, single users to uh, purchase and maintain. Um, so at this point, we are considering it. We just haven't uh, kind of rolled out a development plan for what that would look like. Thank you. Thanks, Karina and Brett. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a question from a listener named Peter. How does the program tell the difference between a cow and a species of similar size and color, such as a bear or moose? 
the auto cow filter, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. uh, to answer that, so thank you very much for that question, Peter. Um, so, Basically, the auto tagger was uh, it was developed uh, based off of a uh, quite a large training set of um, cow images. So it uses it essentially breaks up the image into um, sections and then um, assesses those sections for um, certain elements and components. Um, so we do get the occasional bycatch. Um, so to speak, of um, other species, such as um, the occasional um, cinnamon bear, but that occurrence is quite minimal. Um, our error rate is quite low in terms of um, catching those additional species, uh, but it is largely um, picked off of that, that training set that was used to develop the auto tagger. Um, and with any of these kind of auto recognition softwares, you're always going to have those um, small components of error where you are capturing um different species that are not the targeted ones um whether it's uh, so we run into it some instances when we have cows nuzzling the cam so you can have cows nuzzling the camera so we have a lot of those images in the <laughs> training set <laughs> so if there's um other um organisms um, or species that tend to nuzzle the camera it might get classified as a cow as well just because it displays similar characteristics to what the training set had uh, but once again, um, our um, auto taggers are set to a relatively conservative level. So if there's any sort of um, uncertainty, it tends to go into the um, unclassified um, uh, section as opposed to being classified within that auto tag. So I hope that answered the Thank question. Thank you for here. that answer. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a listener named Daniel who would like to know, are your camera deployment protocols specific to certain mammal species? For example, capturing images of weasels may be different than to capture images for deer. Uh, so yeah, so uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Daniel, for that question as well. Um, it is, it's a really good question because that um, so what your target species um, is that you're assessing comes down to essentially how you set up your cameras and what the question is or what you're looking for. So the protocols that we have used um, have generally been specific to mid to large size mammals. Um, it does capture also um, smaller mammals like weasels and ermines. We just have far fewer occurrences of those um, species um, on our units. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I think so, thank you. Um, the Alistair named Peter again would like to know, um, he says, apparently the cameras do not detect weasels. How does the program deal with assessing for long-tailed weasels as a sensitive species provincially? Uh, can I actually, sorry, do you mind repeating the question? I, I didn't capture the first part of it. He said that the cameras do not apparently detect weasels. How does the program deal with assessing for long-tailed weasels as a sensitive species in the province? That's that's a really good question. So um, the, the units that we um, have uh, deployed, um, in some instances they do catch um, weasels, but um, not frequently. So in terms of monitoring that species in the province, so the ABMI cameras are set up um, at a more of a regional scale. So the program itself was, um, it's not necessarily design, designed to capture those uh, species at risk specifically. Um, and it was more to provide those um, regional based um, outcomes and models. Um, however, if you were to um, deploy units to capture um, those specific species at risk, then you might do it within a specific um, area of interest uh, where um, those um, species are known to exist um, to address that more targeted question. Yeah, so sometimes we do launch more targeted 
as Karina said, our, our overall program is a broad landscape-based program, but sometimes we do launch targeted uh, monitoring programs for specific species. So for example, the yellow rail. Um, at the moment, we don't have any uh, targeted research programs for long-tailed weasels, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't in the future. It just means that for now, we might not have extremely robust data-rich models for the long-tailed weasel, for, as an example. Thank you for that answer. Um, our next question is, oh, sorry, I lost it here. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how long ABMI has been an organization? Absolutely, we can. So <laughs> ABMI, the start of ABMI, um, I guess the concept for ABMI was dreamed up over, from my understanding, a couple of scientists after a conference having some beers in the late 90s. Um, <laughs> And I believe they spent about the next five years or so um, solidifying a, the concept for the for the organization. So I think at the time there were a lot of patchwork monitoring programs being completed. Um, the forestry industry was one of more concern at the time. Um, people wanted to know more about the cumulative impacts of development. So um, these scientists, a few of them, are still maybe even somehow involved with the organization, developed a kind of a, a plan for what it would look like um, in about, by about 2003, 2004. Um, from there, there are some workshops that they held with people from different industry sectors. Um, so you, um, forestry, oil and gas, government, that kind of thing to get feedback on the program. And we became fully operational about three years after that in 2007. So we just celebrated our 10 year anniversary a few years ago. So I guess, yeah, that brings us to about 12 years of, of fully operational. Wow, that's awesome. Right on, that's great. Yeah. Um, a listener named Kristen would like to know, um, the grid of sample site locations is really impressive, but it covers areas like military bases and national parks where land access may not be granted or data may already be collected. And have you taken that into consideration? Absolutely, we have. We actually have a team of people solely dedicated to getting access to those kinds of sites. Um, we also have a lot of private land in Alberta. So those sites definitely present us with challenges for access. Um, but we've also developed a lot of really great relationships with um, different players across the province, which um, sometimes help us to get access to those really difficult to, to get places, which is really awesome. But yes, we definitely, we definitely have several people who work full time exclusively getting us access to those kinds of spots. That's awesome. Wow. Um, there's one more question here from a listener named Paul. Does Fish and Wildlife with AEP utilize ABMI data for FWMIS? Fwemis? Oh, oh, for Fwemis. Oh, okay. Um, I know that we have quite a good relationship with AEP, but I'm not actually sure to the, the extent to which um, Fish and Wildlife use the data, um, but I know that we do have a partner partnership. For example, um, we're trying to establish a partnership through our NatureLinks app to have, for example, that citizen science data shared to Fuemis. Um, I'm not sure the status of that, but um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a really great answer to that question. But um, if if I could get your contact information somehow, I could follow up with you after the webinar. Sure, I can send that on. Great. Um, oh, it looks like there's um, there's a couple more comments. So um, a listener named Kristen commented, ABMI data does not go into the AEP database, database FWMIS. Oh, no, it won't oh. automatically go into it. Sorry, I misunderstood. I was, I was um, understanding that as a question of whether or not the, the staff are also using ABMI data in conjunction with the FWMIS data. My apologies. Thanks. 
Um, sorry, there's one more question here. A uh, listener named Daniel again. He says, I noticed you have developed relative abundance within general habitats such as prairie. Do you have relative abundance measures for mammals within subcategories of prairie? For example, mixed grass or short grass prairie? Um, yes, I think I have one example here. So we can do the intactness and relative abundance measures, all that kind of stuff for kind of any region. So this, this slide just shows the example of the intactness index in the mixed grass region. Um, but basically the short answer is yes, we can do that. Awesome, that's great. Well, that looks like, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> we have lots more questions coming in here. Just one more anyways. <laughs> just when I think um, everyone's done, but um, yeah, a listener named Kirk says, uh, with the continued advancement of technology in biology and in future artificial intelligence, is there a risk of biologists and society in general losing personal or inherent knowledge of our natural ecosystems? Wow, is that Kurt, did you say? Yes. What well, sounds like a very philosophical question. <laughs> yes, um, it does. <laughs> I'm not sure the answer to that question, but uh, my thought is, is that the, just off the top of my head, I'm sure that we could get more into it over a beer or something, but that the, the rise in availability of technology is actually helping us to understand a lot more about our natural systems than we ever have before. So for example, even through one of our programs, um, we put out autonomous recording units in wetlands in Alberta and managed to discover several new populations of yellow rail that we didn't know were there. Um, that's just because we were able to put out these units and we didn't have to rely on people trudging through wetlands at ungodly hours <laughs> to count them. So th that's just one small example. Um, I, I think from the science perspective, it's it's amazing. We're going to learn so much. But awesome. <laughs> that's just one thought. Great answer. Yeah, maybe that's a good place to, to end our webinar then uh, with a philosophical question. <laughs> Be people thinking. <laughs> so well, thank you so much for the awesome presentation today, Brett, and for Krina for popping in to help answer questions. Seems like we had a lot of them today, which is great. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much to the audience, too, everyone, for tuning in today and catching our broadcast. You're welcome to check out KCAP's website, um, and you can register for our SwiftBox webinar. I also sent an email out um, directly for the registration for the link, and that'll be September 17th, and that's through um, Montana Fish and Wildlife. They'll be presenting about SwiftBox recovery. And I would just like to ask everyone, if you don't mind taking one minute to fill out a survey, um, and that helps us keep our native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future, and we can keep doing these, um, these webinars. Also, a recording of this webinar will be posted on the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future, so you're welcome to check that out. And we also have a whole selection of um, past webinars that we've done on a variety of species at risk. So with that, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.